This episode was brought to you by Resilient Nutrition. Pals, pals, greetings, greetings, and welcome to another episode of Everything Endurance. As always, it is delightful to have you with us today. Um, I hope you enjoyed the last episode. Um, that deep dive into sleep, I, I just found particularly fascinating. Um, I'll be absolutely honest, you know, part of the reason I wanted to talk about that in the first place is it's a topic that had been on my mind for a while. Um, over the last few months, my sleep pattern has just felt a bit out of my control. Um, so it is something that I, that I particularly wanted to dive into, and I figured it was something that would apply to a lot of people out there at the moment. And um, it, it seems to have chimed. It's been a particularly popular episode. Um, and I have to say, in the in the few days afterwards, I, if anything, found it harder to sleep. I think I'd, I was overthinking it. I was trying to reply everything at once. Um, but actually, over the last week or so, um, my girlfriend and I have been kind of applying a lot of the tips that I picked up from Greg and I really do feel like I've got more control over my sleep right now which is just absolutely brilliant so you know thanks Greg for that if there's anybody else out there that felt like they got something out of the sleep episode as well then I'm, I'm really pleased that we did it and I'm really pleased for you um, also I did promise you in the episode or rather I kind of strong-armed Greg into promising that we would do at least one more episode with Greg where we were going to tap into that massive noggin of his and talk a little more about nutrition and um, we've done it we've already recorded that that happened a, a couple of three days ago now um, so that is in the memory banks ready to go a couple of weeks time you're going to be able to hear from Greg again um, and uh, it also seems not just were you sort of enjoying the podcast itself, but you've also been enjoying the products we were talking about, which has been great. I mean, I can't imagine why anyone would be interested in delicious, nutty, chocolatey, gooey, delightful treats that you can have while you're training that genuinely make you feel good. I can't imagine why anyone would be into something as delightful as that that happens to be exclusively available on the BTU store at the moment. I mean, you should definitely go and have a look at that. It's literally just store dot beyond the ultimate dot co dot UK. Sorry, did anyone say anything? Store dot beyond the ultimate dot co dot UK. Um, it, it provides me with much amusement because I get to hear Chris swearing behind the scenes about the number of times he's had to go to the post office over the last couple of weeks to post these things out. So by all means, get in the store and cause him some more kerfuffle. That, that always makes my day. Um, I, I tell you what, that's brought me on to another topic. While I'm talking to you guys about stuff you should be doing, um, it's been pointed out to me that I have stopped reminding people to, um, to like and subscribe this podcast. I've just been assuming that you're out there doing it. You know, that you're listening to this and thinking, hey, I, I, I rather like this podcast. Um, for some reason, you have the voice of a retired Brigadier General. Um, but let's let's roll with it. You know, you're, you're out there thinking, well, I, I rather like that podcast. I thought it was interesting and insightful. Well, then do it. You'd be doing us a massive favor if you just click like in whatever app you're in. Whew, go the whole hog, leave us a review, write a sentence about what you think of it, give us a star rating wherever you are, whether you're listening to this in Apple Podcasts or Podbean or, or wherever it is that you're picking this up right now. It genuinely helps us out. Um, it helps raise the profile of the show. It helps bring it to the attention of other people. And ultimately, that helps us bring in more and better guests and more interesting stuff for you to listen to. So please, if you're listening to this right now and you're thinking, I'm into this podcast, I'm going to listen to some more of this, then please hit subscribe, hit like. You'd be doing me a big favor and I'd be really grateful for that. Moving on, should we talk about today's guest? I'm excited about this one. Today's one of those podcast episodes that's great. If you are out there right now about to start a long run or a session in the gym or whatever it is that you're doing, maybe you're doing the ironing or doing the laundry and you're just looking for something to distract you right now, I've got a guest for you. The guest I've got today is an adventurer, um, come endurance athlete, come uh, charity founder, a lot of strings to this bow, all right? But everything she seems to have done, she seems to have done with the flavor of epic applied to it. Um, we're going to be talking to an adventurer today who has 
jumped out of an airplane the height of Mount Everest, next to Mount Everest, finding a landing zone in all that jagged Himalayan rock down there. Um, we're going to talk through that, and that is absolutely mind-blowing. You'll hear me lose my mind a couple of times during that conversation. Um, she's also then later climbed Everest, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about her charity and the work she's done alongside that, working with rangers in the field out in Africa. Um, I... I, there's something up with you if you don't enjoy this podcast is my opinion on it because it's it's such an interesting guest and i had a great time listening to her i hope you're gonna have a great time listening to her as well i am of course talking about holly bodge holly how are you i'm fantastic how are you no i'm i'm very well thank you uh, thank you i'm looking across the city at the moment into into a beautiful snowstorm currently which is uh yeah are you getting Everest flashbacks from this? I am. <laughs> <laughs> a few little uh, yeah, snowflakes drifting past the window, which is really okay, quite maybe, exciting. But maybe not maybe not quite <laughs> Everest scale quite yet. Maybe um, not. <laughs> I know to be honest, I've kind of said the big E word right at the start there. I've jumped in far too early, haven't I? We've 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 got some <laughs> of your bigger exploits to t- uh, talk about later on certainly, but um this being the first time we've had you on the podcast, Holly. I think we should uh, start a little earlier on than that. So let's go for it. Where does where does adventure begin for you? What did you have the kind of upbringing conducive to going out and doing these wild and wonderful things? Absolutely. Um, I started as an adventurer from an early age. I was a really naughty child as well. I don't think that I don't think you have to be naughty to be an adventurer. But I got expelled from my first school, age four. And then I got thrown out of brownies, so I never really went down that route of, uh, you know, learning all those skills. But I did do a lot of competing um, in to triathlon, so um, horse riding, swimming, running, and shooting. And from a really early age, um, I was really competitive. And, uh, you know, I didn't really go to take part. I was absolutely going to, to bring those red ribbons home. Um but what that did, Will, was it really instilled this sense of, of teamwork early on. And I realised quite quickly that I couldn't be good at all of those disciplines. Um, but as I said, we were a pretty strong team. Um, and my specialities were the swimming and the horse riding. I was a terrible runner, still am. Um, and then I went on to, I actually competed uh, for my country um, in horse riding. Wow. Um, but the commitment was massive and it was at a time when you're 17, 18 and just, uh, you know, getting into going out and all those sorts of things. And you think, hang on a minute, what, what's this all about? And I actually went traveling uh, when I was 21, took a break from the, the competition side of things. And I threw myself out of a perfectly good aeroplane for the first time. Um, In an organized fashion, trip. I take it. Yeah, with strapped to somebody else. Yeah, did the old tandem skydive. And that 60 seconds of adrenaline and that 60 seconds of sheer terror completely changed the course of my life. I decided there and then this is what I want to do. I want to be employed as a skydiving camera woman. Pretty big goal, considering I knew no one in New Zealand, knew nothing about skydiving and knew nothing about filming. But none of that mattered because I knew I could have a go at learning those skills. I could try. And it, so when back, you... to the U- back to the UK, carried on working, saved up, back to New Zealand, put myself through my, um, I was a graphic designer, by the way, in London, back to, uh, back to New Zealand, learned to skydive. And several months later, I got my dream job um, and was getting paid to jump out of planes up to 10, 11, 12 times a day, every day. That's and pretty it was, incredible. You just it, it, had you thought about skydiving before that, or did we just literally hit that day? I'm, I, just, I happen to be doing this. My yeah. whole life has changed. Never thought about skydiving before. Just something Amazing. struck a chord. What a morning that was. What a morning. Um, <laughs> but I think looking back, I like to call it the boldness of youth because I didn't overthink that. Um, it was a big goal and. And I just thought, I'll just see if I can achieve it. And when I did, that just gave me this massive confidence and this belief that I could put my mind to whatever I set set my mind to. So I refer to that now, I'm 42, 
And I've tried to keep that mindset going for the last two decades. So I refer to this as holding on to my 21 year old mindset. Um, and I, I think there's so much to be said for just having that, uh, not procrastinating too much and, and having that positive mindset is, is pretty, uh, pretty powerful stuff. Holding on to 21. I like that. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Yeah, boom. Just with a bit bit more, you know, wisdom, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you mean. If I could take some of the uh, knowledge I've accumulated over the last 20 years with me as well, that would be ideal. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, how long were you out there then as a uh, skydiving camera woman? Um, on and off for several years. Um, and then I heard about this opportunity to skydive next to the world's highest mountain mount everest so as a skydiver with several thousand jumps under my belt um i just knew that wasn't that was an opportunity i wasn't going to miss out on so i rang up the organizer and he said hi holly um you'll be the only woman we well, are the only woman at this point to be uh, on the team so i knew that was my way of getting, that was my hook for getting sponsors on board. Um, and he said, can I count you on board? And I said, yes. And he said, that will be 24,000 pounds. Wow. And I said, yeah, absolutely. Count me in. Don't think I've ever had 24,000 pounds just sitting there waiting for an adventure. But that really gave me the, the push to go and find the sponsors um, and get them to buy into my passion and, and my vision for this and that happened like it's never easy getting sponsors on board but I did manage to achieve that um, so what did skydive Everest involve it involved uh, flying up to 29 and a half thousand feet in a small aircraft that had never flown to that altitude before uh, Pilatus Porter which I jumped out of many times in New Zealand great little um, aeroplanes so we didn't even know if we were going to get up to the the desired altitude. And then um, I free uh, to for one minute, pulled my parachute at 18,000 feet, and I landed at 12,500 feet. So if none of that means anything, to put it in perspective, when I was jumping in New Zealand, we were jumping out of a plane at 12, 12,500 feet, and here we were landing at that altitude. Wow. So my parachute was three times the size of my normal chute because of the, the higher altitude. Um, I can't even imagine being under my normal canopy at, at that altitude. I'm not sure I've ever stopped. I kept going. <laughs> like a cannonball. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, so just a, I really want to dig into that for a second. We're talking about, you know, you are landing at the height you usually would have been leaping out of a plane from. So, you yeah. know, you've got a few thousand jumps under your belt at this point, but this is much much higher much much thinner air presumably yep. much lower temperatures yep. what what on earth what on earth does it look like as you're looking out the side of a plane in those conditions what's what's going through your head so minus 60 wind chill at 29 and a half thousand feet i'd never jumped with oxygen before so I had an oxygen um system in the plane and then switched to a bottle just before jumping out um so just to rewind, the landing area was perfectly big enough, assuming we made it back there. There were very other safe places, very few other safe places to land apart from this, this particular landing spot. So that was imperative. Um, the flight up to altitude um, took 45 minutes. And normally in New Zealand, I'd be chatting away and, and you know, it would be quite social on this occasion it was pretty lonely 45 minutes because it was just me listening to myself breathing into this oxygen mask Felt just like, you and darth vader yeah yeah my darth vader's ugly sister you know it was <laughs> uh, it was quite scary and you're looking out the window thinking seriously i hope i don't have to bail out of this airplane in an emergency because there really were not very many places to land in this environment um anyway next thing Nothing could have prepared me for what happened. We uh, we got up to 29,500 feet. Plane made it up there, which was good. Door opens. First person to skydive Everest was about three seconds in front of me. He jumped out. Then my camera flyer climbed out onto the camera step, ready to film me. I'm giving my count, ready, set. 
And the next thing, my camera flight hand is on my shoulder, pushing me back into the plane, saying, don't jump. And unbeknown to me, the pilot had held up the stop sign behind me, don't let the jumpers out. But it was too late. I had too much momentum on my ready set. Uh, and I'm backpedaling in the door thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to fall out of this aeroplane. And I did. I fell out of the plane. Wow. So- I think- <laughs> I'm just trying to put myself in that moment. You feel the hand on your shoulder. You know you're not supposed to go out of the plane now, but you've gone. It's happened. Yeah. I mean, Holly, you've done a few thousand jumps, you're saying, by this point. But, I mean, that must have been fear in that moment, surely. It was. And and jokes aside, I mean, people say, was skydiving Everest the most incredible thing ever? No, it was absolutely terrifying because... The clouds had rolled in. And when you're at these altitudes, the minute you see the clouds coming up the valley very quickly, you can be totally engulfed in them. And I've really found that much, um, very much so with mountaineering. So the pilot had held the stop sign up because these clouds were racing up. And then it was it was almost complete cloud cover over the ground. So I had no visuals on the ground below i.e. where is my landing area and I also had no clue of where I was in relation to the landing area because the pilot had held up the stop stop sign I didn't know if we were in our right spot above above the landing area and with skydiving you don't have any fancy equipment it's just literally it's your eyes you've got to be able to to see it um so Came through the clouds. That's when I got my first glimpse of the tremendous, immense mountains around me. But there was no time for admiring the view. Pulled parachute, 18,000 feet. Oxygen mask was obscuring my vision. So I decided to take it off. Um, And I was just hell-bent on getting and landing, making a safe landing. so when you're on skydiving, you're on your own. There's nobody to ask, especially, you know, even when you're a beginner, it, it's particularly uh, daunting when you are like, well, what do I do now? Um, and you, you have to back yourself to make the right decisions um, and to really believe in the decisions that you, you end up making. So oxygen mask came off. I felt a bit dizzy because it was still pretty high, you know, 18,000 feet. Yeah. Um, And I did make it back to the landing area. Um, And I was really fortunate because about two or three minutes later, complete whiteout. You couldn't see, you know, ahead of you at all. Um, And I felt really fortunate to walk away from that jump. About three days later, another team of skydivers went up. Same thing happened. Stop sign went up. Don't let them out. They'd all got out. And for them, unfortunately, the cloud went all the way to the ground. Oh, no. One girl broke her back and, and her, her leg and another guy landed in a yak farm. Well, oh, well, incredible. So what? what <laughs> well, yeah, I, I don't know how well that ended for the yak and I hope the yak was fine uh, in all of this as well. But um, yeah. I mean, that really goes to show what happened to you. You, you got to your 18,000 feet level and yeah. boom, you pop out of the cloud. At least you can see something. These guys yeah. never never had a chance to make the landing that that would be terrifying especially you know when you're like when we're um working in where i was in new zealand in lake taupo you know you know that terrain like the back of your hand it's like reading the front page of a newspaper you just know exactly wherever you open it it doesn't matter because you know exactly where you are but when you open in a strange place especially you know somewhere like the himalayas (laughs) it's like it's pretty daunting yeah, you know, the absolutely. skydive is easy. It's the it's the landing, the, the getting down, and the landing that that's you know where the uh, skill comes in. But then it's not even skill when the weather comes in. That's just pure. That's that just comes down to luck. I, how how much time I, are we talking about between you leaping out of that plane and and making your landing? Five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah, so one minute free fall and then, well, maybe, sorry, but normally I'd be under canopy for four or five minutes. So maybe seven, seven or eight minutes because the parachute was massive. So it was a lot slower. You sort of feel like you're a student again or driving a, you know, a bus. <laughs> um, 
But anyway, so I landed and uh, Reuters news agents agency put a microphone in front of me. I'm not sure where they arrived from. I didn't see them beforehand, but, you know, they were there when I landed. I was babbling on and um, next thing I was on the front of the Catman Do Times the next day. I flew back to, to the UK the following day and um, got upgraded on the way home, thanks to Virgin. Lovely. <clears throat> Cameraman had to stay in the back, so <laughs> see, you in, see you in London. Got put in a hotel for 24 hours, courtesy of the BBC, and then I did six live TV interviews, um, two of which were CNN and CBS. And they said, don't worry, you're just going out live to America. And I got asked how I acclimate on, on you know, live TV. Didn't know what acclimate meant. Turns out it's American for acclimatized. Brilliant. Um, so I just answered that in a very British way and said, very well, thank you. And you? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but jokes aside, the media was terrifying. That was more scary than anything on the expedition and something that I wasn't totally prepared for. Um, just got thrown very much into the TV, radio, global media, limelight. Yeah, I mean, it's worth bearing in mind here. You're still, you, you're very young by this point. You've just hurled yeah. yourself out of a plane next to Everest and <laughs> found yourself back in London and then wham, limelight, have this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then the funny thing is, is, you know, there's sort of, I remember my, my dad got quite upset with a Metro reporter because I was on a plane at the, you know, coming home and this journalist was getting really irate about, I want a photo for the front page. It did go on the front page, but he got really rude. And I think my dad just told him, bugger off, you know, stop hassling me for a photo that I can't give you at the minute. And um, the next thing, give it a day, maybe two. They don't want to know you. <laughs> you're literally no. on that. You're the fish and chip wrapper. Wow. So it was, it, was, it was just funny experience just to be thrust into the global media and then as quick as you're in, you're out again. <laughs> you didn't uh, You didn't just sort of sit around and rest for long, though, did you? As is quite often no. the case when people have gone and done something big and ridiculous, they then get swept yeah. up into something else equally big and ridiculous. So, yeah, so what, what, yeah. what happened after you uh, got back from your big skydive then? Yeah, so this was a massive selfish indulgence uh skydive everest but um it was also it raised a tremendous amount of money for charity over um two hundred thousand pounds was raised wonderful um, and that was sent over to schools and etc in nepal so that side of it was made it incredibly worthwhile um so i got home and it is a really common thing the post expedition blues you put your heart and your soul into achieving your big goal and you sell yourself to the to the sponsors and do everything you can to keep them on board. So when it is all over, you just think, well, what's next? And luckily for me, phone call two weeks later saying, hi, Holly, would you like to take part in another world first expedition? And I said, yes. What is it? <laughs> and they said it's a thousand kilometer horse race across Mongolia riding semi wild horses. I knew I had the skill set to do that, so I didn't have to go and learn those skills, but if I had, I would have. Um, and I made one phone call to a lady that was on the Skydive Everest trip and said, will you sponsor it? She had an IT company, and she said yes. So that was the easiest, logistically, that was the easiest adventure. The easiest bit of fundraising oh, you've ever done. It was. Amazing. It was tremendous. Um, so... Riding across Mongolia, raw, the rawest adventure I've ever done, excuse the pun, um, nine days in the saddle, 13 day, thirteen hours a day riding. Yeah, this so we're the, talking raw. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're talking <laughs> like hardcore raw. Um, this was the first year it had run. This this is now an annual adventure, the Mongol Derby, which I highly But at the time, you were recommend. the guinea pigs. <laughs> yeah, we were total guinea pigs, and it was brilliant. There was, I'm sure these days it's it's a very well oiled machine, but back then it was just. I remember at the fin at the start line there was 25 of us, and um, two people fell off. The winner, in fact, Charles. Um, fell off at the start line because the horse had a freak out because we all had saddle bags and all this gear and the horse weren't 
the horses weren't used to having all this stuff flapping around and one of them had a total freak out and I remember the Mongolians just thinking these guys these this is a suicide mission they are not going to get to the finish line a thousand kilometers away you know I mean look at them they're lying on the floor <laughs> <laughs> And, and a, a part of me did think, gosh, how is this going to go? Um, so I rode a total of 25 horses and there were two rules to this race. One, you couldn't ride at night because uh, the terrain was too dangerous and we only had GPS. We didn't have any topographical information. So it was just um, A to B with a straight line between the no two. No idea of any surprise mountains in between you or anything, just from this point just to this A point. Just A to B, straight line, what could go wrong? Well, there you go. You want to keep it interesting, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so that was one rule. Couldn't ride at, n- at night. And the other rule was you couldn't ride more than 40 kilometres on one horse. So I was averaging probably two, sometimes three horses a day. Um, and on this one occasion, I was riding with another girl because, you know, I arrived over there thinking I'd do it on my own. But really, blonde uh, Western woman middle of the mongolian step if you don't have to be why why put yourself in that when when some when a blonde south african is right an hour in front or behind me it's like let's buddy up yeah makes sense um and it's more fun you know so anyway we thought it's four o'clock in the afternoon we've got four hours left in the day we'll push on for the next campsite for that night and we were quite competitive at this point Um, I think we were probably in second and third position in the race. We're thinking, you know, we're going to crack on A to B, straight line. Uh, So we thought we'll take the direct route. We'll go up over this sort of mountain top and the checkpoint will be the other side. So we did that. Very little water on us. Silly in hindsight, um, but obviously thought we'd be at the checkpoint quick enough. Yeah. Um, Anyway. Long story short, we went up the first mountain. There was another mountain, went up that. There was another mountain. Before you know it, it was pitch black with no water. Temperatures plummeted to below zero. So it goes up to about 30 degrees in the day and then below zero at night when we were there. And um, we had the smallest one-man tent on the market for the two of us because she didn't have a Well, at least you were (laughs) cosy. I'm trying to put a positive spin on this, Holly. <laughs> well, I didn't have a hobble. A hobble's a leather, uh, strip of leather that goes around the, the horse's legs to stop them running off. There's very little places to tie them up. So this is how the Mongolians do it. Of course. I didn't have any hobbles. She had. I had a tent. She had hobbles. So she hobbled her horse. And these horses, they're feisty. They don't like you going anywhere near their feet. And they're, they're really hardy, tough animals. I mean, they're fending for themselves often for for many months of the year through the winter. So they're really, they know what they're doing, most of them. There's dead horses as well all over Mongolia. So it's very much survival of the fittest. So if you don't know what you're doing or they get sick, then they literally, they die. It's pretty extreme place. Um, So she hobbled her horse. I tied my horse to a great big rock. hobbles. We're lying in this tiny little tent, freezing, it's quite scary. There's strange noises, wolves, big herds of wild horses, lots of stuff going on. I'm scared of the dark. <laughs> um, Great stuff. Hus- husband rang on the sat phone. Um, I think I was the only one with the sat phone and he thought it was hilarious. He was absolutely killing himself laughing. They were stuck in the mountains and that actually lightened the whole situation up and saw the funny side of it. Anyway, next thing you know, hop, 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 hop in the dark. That's her horse hopping off. They didn't tell us a hobbled horse can hop up to five kilometres an hour. That two is hobbled, an important detail. <laughs> it is an imp- <clears throat> Two hobbled horses hobbled together can move up to five kilometres an hour as well. Hop in unison. It's quite incredible to watch, apart from when it's your horse and they're doing a yeah, runner. disappearing down a mountain yeah next thing you hear this great big rock being dragged down the mountain that's my horse then the bridle broke horses went off and we thought right we've lost the horses um obviously you feel bad because someone owns those horses um so you've just lost those for the, you know you want to find those horses again um 
But we thought there's nothing we can do in the dark. This is silly. We're just going to stay put and first light, we'll go and look for them. So that's what we did. First light, the horses are right next to the tent. And it was a windy night. The tent's flapping around. And these horses don't like um, flapping materials. So it made me think, um, what else is out there that's scarier than us, you know? Yeah. So we thought this is going to be easy. Catch the horses, get onto our checkpoint, carry on in the race. Took a further eight hours to catch my horse, who was called Golf. I named them after the phonetic alphabet. And he wasn't called Golf when, when we reunited, you know, got him back. But Some slightly different four-letter words, I imagine. But yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not sure they begin with a G either. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, Golf was never further than a metre away from me at any point. Just could not catch this horse. Um, in the end, caught the horse. Uh, by this stage, we'd been without water for 14 hours. Temperature's gone back to 30 degrees. So we were, you know, feeling a bit like we'd been dragged through a hedge backwards, which we practically had. Got to the next checkpoint, got some water, got on the next horses, carried on. But what it did sort of make us realise is there was no prize for winning this race. The prize was the experience and hanging out with the locals. And when I say hanging out, we were still in the saddle 13 hours a day and, and you know, moving at speed. Yeah. Um, but to put it in perspective, the winner came in in seven days we came in in nine and i think the last guys came in in 11 days and the winner sat at the finish line for two days waiting for us wishing that he was still wishing back out they there. were still back out there yeah um richard dunwoody the race jockey he was one of the starting riders he did one leg said it's not really for me not really wow. my sort of horses because obviously he's used to million dollar race horses so he flew back to the UK, did Strictly Come Dancing, got thrown out in the first week, flew back to Mongolia and met us at the finish line. Really? Well, he had a big week as well, didn't he? So, we're, so he got, as you can imagine, quite ridiculed for his uh, for his dancing skills, but good good effort getting back to Mongolia. Yeah, um, true. So, yeah, it was an incredible experience. Um, it, it was just total freedom. How else and when else would you experience a country in, in just, you know, I just thought to myself, if I went and did a riding holiday, for example, and they were like, you know, you can go and ride for two or three hours and then we're going to come back for lunch and do another ride in the afternoon. You know, it, there was none of that. This was just totally, we decided. It was up to us, how, what, where. Um, it was phenomenal. And the logistics of it was, you know, all these horses had to then be transported back wow. to 40 kilometers back to where they'd come from now some of these horses were a little bit slow they they didn't like being on their own they were you know obviously herd herd animals and on this one occasion one day i was riding on my own and i was on this horse and um it just it wouldn't wouldn't move i think it took me seven hours to do 40 kilometers so i oh, had to how make long this has that whip. usually been taking you Oh, the fastest leg was two and a half. Wow. Okay. You, yeah. And that wow. was, but that horse, I'll tell you about that horse in a minute. That horse was a bit nuts. Anyway, <laughs> I had to make a um, whip out of my saddle. I just had to get the old Leatherman out, strip some leather, just tie it together. I never used it. It was just so I could dangle it to the side. And it was called Mr. Whippy. <laughs> and the minute this horse saw Mr. Whippy, it started moving a bit quicker. Then we ran into this herd of three or 400 wild horses at a watering hole and i'm not joking the whole lot moved off at full gallop so when i made mr whippy i wasn't exactly envisaging then galloping in a herd of i just meant maybe a trot but next thing we're in a full gallop with with this giant herd it was like i can only imagine what surfing on a tsunami wave would i mean ha having been in tsunami by the way I, feel uh, I can say that but the energy and the the power was phenomenal um, I can only imagine I, the sound I just I thought mean, I just thought how is this going to end uh, oh, I, okay uh, how how long were you getting dragged <laughs> along in this herd of three or four hundred wild horses well just so we're um clear my horse was freaking out as much as I was like I think the horse was pretty scared 
Um, luckily for me, the, the wild horses um, were just going to another watering hole. Well, that is lucky. So we, we ground to a halt and I was just like, thanks very much. I'm going to go over here now and sort of didn't take my eyes off them. Tried to maintain eye contact like, no, seriously, we're going over here now and you guys can stay put. Mr. Whippy, <laughs> keep moving horse, horses, you know, pretty freaked out. Um, anyway, they didn't follow us, which was good. But we had a few, exper- well, I had a few experiences on this race that it was just, I loved it. But it was, and I was probably the only one, I think, that didn't have, some people had such bad sores and like really all down the back of their thighs. So well, this is what I was getting at at the beginning when you were saying like, oh, it's a bit, I mean, I only say know, it's sore, it was hardcore this, yeah. but yeah. For, it sounds like for a lot of them, it really must have been. Yeah, I mean, I just like to make the joke uh, that it was raw, but for some people, it was tremendously raw. Um, so, you know, like on the Tour de France, when I don't know if this is a myth, but when they rub the, the their sores raw all the time so they don't start healing and get infected. I've, so I've heard about raw. this. Yeah. Anyway, these these guys were taking on that. That, you know, they were doing that, literally keeping these these wounds raw, so they weren't getting in, healing up with dirt and grime and whatever. Oh my days! And it was pretty bad, I have to say, some of them. But where I didn't get sores is uh, when I was riding. I never put my weight down in the saddle when you're like cantering or galloping. So some people were just like a sack of potatoes or bouncing around on the back of the horse. And that obviously was giving them sores on the back of their legs. So I just did the whole ride up on my knees. And that just worked an absolute treat. I think I got one tiny sore in the inside of my knee as I was going over the finish line. Oh, wow. Well done. And this old Mongolian guy, this is the biggest compliment. <laughs> he came over and he said, you know, you, you, you're you, a good rider. And I was like, thank you. I'll take that. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. You've had the Mongolian seal of approval. I've had the well Mongolian done. seal of approval. I'm not sure if the next comment was, let's see your sores sort of thing. <laughs> like, let's see. <laughs> yeah. But um, no, but seriously, it was, uh, that's technique. You know, if you're yeah. going to sit, put your all your weight chafing on a saddle for a thousand kilometers, you, you're just going to ruin yourself. Yeah, absolutely. You're going to give before the saddle does. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. No. It's like on the mountains, just tape your feet up before you get blisters. Well, yeah, absolutely. We uh, Any of the sort of many ultra runners listening to this will know exactly about that principle. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, just to finish on the <clears throat> Mongol Derby, the last horse <clears throat> uh, that did the two and a quarter, two and a half hour last stint um i'd learned the word for racehorse in mongolian because i thought you know i'm going to get a slightly faster horse and uh could have backfired the (laughs) had to tack up these horses and they were just spinning around on the on the spot normally when i get on these horses because you you rein ride them one-handed and normally you just give them a tap on each side of their neck canter in a small circle bring them back as if to say hiya i'm holly and I'm in charge. Yeah. This horse had to, they, the Mongolians had to tack it up. I got, you know, legged up onto the horse, little tap on the left side. <laughs> We're off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. It's raining. I'm holding the GPS with the straight line to the finish line. I'm like, yeah, okay. Mountain in the distance, just head for that. This horse just had one eye. Um, literally galloped the whole thing and and then took 10 minutes to stop at the other end at the finish line and <laughs> you get these marmot holes which are about a meter wide by a meter deep and this horse jumped every single one of them <laughs> terrifying <laughs> what a big finish though you got a sprint finish to your it, thousand kilometer it was horse such ride. a big finish and and the people that were already at the finish line like yeah and then realized i couldn't stop and then uh, probably thinking, wow, how did she get that horse? I wish I'd had that horse. And it's like, yeah. well, I learned, I learned the word for racehorse. Um, and I got it. Yeah, um, brilliant. Yeah, no, it was brilliant. And that, that adventure raised a tremendous amount of money as well for, um, for charity. Um, so another selfish indulgence, <laughs> as I like to call them, but it had a, 
a, a good meaning behind it as well. Um, yeah. Well, and yeah, I, I suppose... I'm just that... going to have a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> you crack on. Well, fantastic. And what year are we talking about then for this, uh, for the ride across Mongolia? Um, 2009. 2009, wow. Yeah. yeah. So when did... Um, I don't want to leap too far ahead and uh, too early, but I can see behind you there are there are many artistic renderings of elephants. We we've got your Count the Elephants charity to talk about. When did when yeah. did that become a thing for you? Because it's it's obvious up to this point that although yeah. you've been doing these selfish indulgences as you call them, you've been making sure <laughs> there's a charity angle to this as well. And that's definitely that's yep. that seems to have become a, a bigger drive for you as your adventure career has gone on. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, so as I said earlier, my roots were in graphic design. Um, and that's what I was doing before I moved to New Zealand to pursue a career in skydiving. Um, and as much as, and I've always carried on with the design. That's that's something I'm really passionate about. Um, and as much as I was loving all my adventuring, it wasn't, especially with the skydiving. So sort of when you're skydiving. 10, 12 times a day, every day. I wasn't using the creative side of my brain as much as I wanted to be. Um, so I went back to university, developed a program for students learning to skydive, an e-learning program. And then I went on and did a master's several years later and I was, I was um, studying sustainable design. And I was actually studying a material called vegetable ivory, which is a nut from a palm tree from the South American rainforests. And it's a beautiful material and it's it's got a really cool story in its own right. But it was its material similarity to elephant ivory that got me researching the African elephant crisis. And I was just totally shocked by what I was reading, that 96 elephants are poached each day in Africa, 35,000 elephants a year. And there's only just under 400,000 currently left in the wild. So kind of puts it in perspective so I wanted to use my design background to come up with a fresh awareness raising campaign so what I did was I visualized this data what do I mean by that I've got an exhibition that showcases 35,000 elephants on a wall and to actually see and connect with this data in a purely visual way is highly impactful like if you tell someone 35,000 elephants or you read it, doesn't really have that same impact. But to actually see it is, uh, you know, I've, I've I literally had people come to the exhibition and burst into tears and say, we just did, we had no idea the sheer scale of, of the problem. I also built this uh, necklace, which has won five design awards so far. It's quite a piece. Um, it's uh, 96 elephants cut in vegetable ivory. One elephant is cut in brass. Um, and one elephant is facing the other way to say that this crisis can still be turned around. So what I'm doing is I'm using design as a powerful communication tool to bridge the gap between scientific data on one hand and human connection on the other. Four years ago, I climbed to the summit of Everest and I took the flag, how many elephants with me. And that I, what I realized was I could start using my adventures as well, I was wondering how to integrate the adventures into the, the my passion for conservation and design. Um, and I realized the adventures were a great platform to, to, to fundraise. Um, and to date, I've raised over £400,000 through my adventures. But the other thing my campaign does, so it's called How Many Elephants? It's now a UK registered charity. So on the one hand, it's, it's an awareness raising campaign. But on the other, it's uh, celebrating and supporting and championing um, female rangers on the front line. So these days with the adventure, I'm just I'm not interested anymore in, in world records or world firsts. I know it's easy to say that if you've if you've got a couple, but just doesn't interest me at all. You know, in my now at 42, <laughs> <laughs> it's all about adventure with purpose. So in the last three years, I've had the absolute privilege um of spending time on the front line with all female anti-poaching teams one in south africa the black mambas 
and one in Zimbabwe, um, Akashinga, and uh, another in called National Park Rescue in in Zimbabwe. And I can tell you, well, this these experiences just blows any other adventure I've had out the window. In that the, this is this is real life scary stuff, you know. I remember one night patrolling with Akashinga in Zimbabwe and we dropped out in the middle of nowhere with our supplies and a, a, a tent. And I remember helping them put the tent up. These women have all got AK-47s. I'm the only one that hasn't. Yeah. One of them hangs back at the camp because she said, oh, you know, if a poacher finds the the our camp, they will, you know, steal everything and, and burn the tent or maybe steal it, who knows. But either way, she she hung back to protect there. We then do a big loop around the the, uh, the the tent just to see what's out there. And, you know, there's very clear signs of poachers. There's, you know, wild animals. And, and I'm just thinking, I barely know these women. And these women are my lifeline. And I felt pretty exposed. You know, it wasn't like I could have, I couldn't have just ran off or even there was no phone signal, couldn't have made a phone call. I've had enough. I want to get off. (laughs) You know. (laughs) That's it. You're there. It's happening. I was in. Yep. And and they're they're, they're tough. These women, they they walk. I mean, our patrols were six, seven hours. They didn't stop for a pee once. (laughs) Wow. I was literally, and you, you have to whisper, you know, it's all sort of sign language. And I'm like, you know, I'm just going to just gonna nip in the bush. Just going to have a pee. You know, they're, they're hardy. They don't drink a lot of water either, but I'm obviously why they don't pee. But still, you know, and then I was, I stood out like a, a sore thumb being a, a white woman and a blonde white woman in the bush. So they then the, the following time said, I'll wear our uniform just to help you blend in. Incredible privilege you feel walking with these women in their uniform. It didn't really help me blend in, I must say. And then they said later, you know, really anyone that's that's really uh, knows what they're doing out in the bush would would smell you a mile off, like your shampoo, your washing detergent. You know, they'd be that in tune with different oh, wow. smells. And I said to them, sort of jokingly, you know, if I didn't wash for a couple of weeks, do you think they'd still pick up on me? And they're like, yeah. Definitely, because you're just a different smell. A different set of smells. You know? You're not, f- yeah. yeah. You you don't smell right in that place. Yeah. So who would have known it? I, you know. I, but on a mountain, I feel, you know, it's like I feel in my environment. I feel I've got the skill set. I've got the experience. Out in the African bush, I'm literally a fish out of water, and and it was it was scary stuff. I mean, what an um, incredible opportunity, though! Like, what what, what a privilege incredible. to be able to go up and 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 see it in person to get an idea of the kind yeah. of work that that your charity's funding as well. Well, when I got home, I filmed crews and all sorts ringing up saying, "How did you do that?" And to be honest, certainly with the Black Mambas, but with Akashinga, they said, "Oh, you know, you're the only person that's gone out on an overnight patrol with them, just on your own." So I think all the adventure background definitely uh, yeah. came into play, but also I've you know spent a lot of time supporting and and raising money for these women. So clearly very invested in and have their best interest at heart. Um, but yeah, with the Black Mambas, I had free reign. I spent several weeks with these women and I ate with them. I slept out in their, you know, where their their posts, um, you know, just totally immersed. Well, his film crews might get two hours a day with them. Yeah, of course. And it, what it did, Will, was I was just trying to gain an intimate insight into what drives and motivates these women to do the work that it, they're doing. Because they're not only working on the front line of conservation, they're also, you know, they're now the breadwinners in their families. They're fantastically positive role models in their communities. They're educators. They go into the schools. Black members have over 1,200 children on a Bush Babies program. That's amazing. Um, and they're changing the attitudes towards the role of women in Africa and around the world. So, um, you know, massive hats up. But as I said, these ladies are tough. You know, often they've come from, 
you know, some of them are AIDS orphans. They might have come from um, abusive relationships. Um, but they all come from extremely poor communities. And, you know, when you when you see the camaraderie amongst them and the pride with which they wear these uniforms, it's it's really humbling. Um, one of the Akashinga Rangers, I was driving with her, and so she's in a sign written four by four. She's in her uniform driving through a village where she grew up. And she said to me, she turned to me and said, the men in this village told me that women can never drive vehicles like this. Mm-hmm. And she said it with her chest puffed out like... <laughs> As she revs yeah. her engine driving past. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, but it was brilliant to see, you know. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm very passionate about supporting the work and, and really amplifying the voices of of these women i will we'll make sure there's some links to your work underneath this podcast as well but it, yeah, anyone you. who's picked up on these points you're mentioning right now where where should they go and have a look if they want to yeah, want to so, see more um, about this right now yeah so website uh, howmanyelephants.org and as i said before we're a uk registered charity um and then my personal website is hollybudge.com but if you are sitting there thinking you know, I'd like to get involved, want to make a difference, absolutely reach out, get in touch. We are real people at the end of those emails. So you will hear back uh, from us to reply to, to every email that comes through. And especially since lockdown, COVID, I've been blown away by the amount of people that have come forward with time and skills and want to get involved. And it's it's when you start bringing passionate people together, the sparks really do start flying and it's amazing to see. So if that's you, then absolutely reach out to me, um, get in touch and, and I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, and there's and, lots uh, of different ways to get involved, you know. I think you just made that point really, really well there that, you know, this this maybe isn't a great time for everyone to be getting financially involved in this sort of thing, but it probably is a pretty good time for you to donate time and skills to something really, really important here. Yep. Well, a lot of people will are saying, you know, the time that they would have been commuting or driving yeah, to work, exactly. suddenly they've yeah. got a couple of hours more in their day. So, um, yeah, no, for us, it's, and it's, you know, it's been tough. It's been tough for everyone, but as a, a charity and on the fundraising efforts and not being able to put on live events, it's it's been a difficult year. And these women, they need to keep doing their work. That's the hardest thing is you don't want to start seeing these conservation efforts being undone. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's so important, especially without the tourism, poachers can act, uh, you know, without eyes and ears so much on the ground. So it's imperative these women do keep, keep, keep doing the work that they're doing. Yeah, yeah. And not only the women, the men too. We don't hate men, by the way. We just, I find with my charity and well, in life in general, the more specific I am, the the more I seem to be able to not get overwhelmed. <clears throat> so um, I'm, I'm always quite specific. So it's um, African elephants, it's anti-poaching and it's, it's female rangers, but nothing <laughs> against anyone else. Fair enough. I, I have to say, I wasn't taking any offense personally in that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wonderful. Um, yeah. Well, I am just going to check. Do you need to run off? Because we just skipped over something in that conversation. That. Yeah. Um, no, I've got. Um, I can do another ten minutes. Good, because you went back to Everest, and I really wanted to get into the your charity that you've done there. I didn't want us to miss out on that. But was it four or five years ago? Everest drew you back in again, didn't it? Yeah. Four Not years jumping ago. out next to it this time. You 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 actually did the climb, right? Yeah, so um, I'm just going to cough. <coughs> Sorry, you have to cut that bit out. <coughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, so when I first laid eyes on Mount Everest, when I skydived it, that was in 2008, I knew one day I would be back to climb to the, the top, but I knew nothing about climbing big mountains. So I set about learning how to uh, mountaineer, and I quickly found myself back in the Himalayas. I climbed Mira Peak, six and a half thousand meters, and then Burundi the following week, which was seven thousand meters. And Burundi's is like one of the most remote mountains in the the Himalayas. It's called the Death Valley because you go in 
over a six and a half thousand meter pass and then you go out over a pass and if the weather closes in they can't get helicopters in into this valley so so it's quite committing and i remember that we um we were trekking for after we'd done uh mira it was about an 18 day trek round to do burunsi we just didn't see anyone there was nothing out there and you weren't staying in tea houses or anything it was just proper camping out under the stars with brilliant beautiful so anyway i found i was quite good at climbing mountains and i don't mean that arrogantly i mean at the altitude i just dealt with the altitude really well and that's a lot fair of enough people some don't. people it just bowls over yeah yeah and i actually got to the summit of both of those mountains about two hours before anyone else in the team wow and people were saying well hang on how did you do that and you know there was some big sort of built up guys with their six packs like well hang on what have what have you got that we haven't got and at the time i didn't know but now i realize i i i've developed this technique called the mirror step so hear me out on this one Go when on. you leave a high camp it's pitch dark when you're going for the summit it's pitch dark it's freezing cold nothing to see so i just got in behind one of the sherpas and when he moved his foot i moved mine when he moved his foot i moved mine now that sounds very simple but over time what that does is it just keeps your mind focused and quiet so i now led expeditions in the himalayas and what i've seen is people once those negative voices find their way in especially at altitude it's really hard to get rid of them. And you you know when you're cycling and you get behind the group and you, however fast just you're trying to catch up, you never catch them up. You're just like, oh. Yeah. I mean, on the mountain you have that, but you start thinking, God, am I going to be left behind? Am I going to be on my own out here? Am I going to die here? And and you, these voices can really take a hold. So when you use the mirror step, it's, it's quite meditative. You're just moving your legs. Now I'm a little less selfish with this, by the way. When I This is how I climb all the mountains I've climbed now, using this technique. But I, I now rotate with my climbing partner. So I'll go in front for a bit. They follow me. And then we rotate round. Um, as I said earlier, I'm a really bad runner. And I went to the Love Trails running. I was speaking there at, at 2019. Oh, and gosh. In um, South Wales. And I just was out running and I'm, I'm quite conscious, you know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not, not a natural runner by any stretch. And I thought I'm going to test out this technique with running, see if it works. So I, I got behind this girl, she had a nice set of um, turquoise Salomon trainers. Couldn't tell you what she looked like, but those <laughs> trainers, I literally followed those trainers for about two hours. Everywhere those trainers went, I went and it was brilliant. <laughs> and I've tried it when I'm out, uh, you know, doing hikes and stuff, you know, I don't know you're in Snowdonia doing a scramble or maybe a scramble, not so much a hike when there's a bit more rhythm. If you're like feeling, oh God, I'm really starting to get tired now. And, you know, it's late in the day and I've had enough. Just literally go and tuck in behind someone else and just start following their, their boots. It works. You no heard it first, it is, ladies and gentlemen, right here. The mirror steps. So anyway, had that technique, started using that on other mountains. My first big, uh, well, they're all big. <laughs> My first 8,000 meter peak um, was Choi Oyu, climbed from Tibet. Um, and so I started using that technique on there. We, only five of us summited for that whole season. Wow. Um, yeah, that was that was quite a, a tough. And, and just stepping up, Will, to that, going from a 7,000, um, meter peak to an 8,000 you really notice like when you start getting up into the death zone don't really like the term but you know but we yeah we've, we've all come to be hurting. familiar with the term now yeah and it, you know it really is body body screaming no mind is whispering yes wow. mind's like come on keep going but it hurts even if you're that sherpa climbing everest for the you know 22nd 23rd time Life at 8,000 meters hurts. Wow. So I knew. So then I went and I led an expedition on Amma de Blam, which is pretty crazy mountain. If you want to see a crazy campsite, Google Amma de Blam Camp 2. 
crazy, crazy campsite um, and smells of pee. That slightly ruins oh, the. It's like a bird's nest, but it, it, you can imagine when you see it, there's not many places to actually pee when you're there. Oh, of course. Um, so then I did a first ascent in Mongolia. I was looking for a way, reason to go back to Mongolia, and that that seemed a, a, a good enough reason. So got lots of mountaineering experience under my belt um, before trying Everest. Not saying Everest is is it's the highest, but it's certainly not a technical mountain. It's 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 the time on the mountain. I was on the mountain for forty seven days, which is pretty standard sixty day expedition. And you're just getting weaker, you know. From the minute you arrive, it's you're not building your strength there. It's just about trying to maintain strength and you do three rounds of acclimatization and it's tough. You know, you really, you're above, I was above 5,000 meters for that whole 47 days. I've I've never heard anyone describe a a, a mountaineering expedition, but certainly an Everest expedition without it sounding pretty grueling. Yeah, it's grueling. Now I climbed on the north side of Everest because I wanted to avoid the queues. Um, You still get queues on the north, but, it's very barren, the north. You drive up to base camp and the Chinese have spent a lot on the infrastructure. So brand new roads. Um, I got sponsored by an IT company to promote Wi-Fi in remote places. So I took this um, modem all the way to the summit. Oh, Turns wow. out they've put a big mobile phone mask up there and not on the summit, but near somewhere around base camp. And you can get 3G on the summit. Boom. who knew it what? i didn't tell the sponsors that i thought no that's too much like you know but the, <laughs> but the reality is you get three you, you know you get 3g on the summit of everest which is quite funny given that struggle with wi-fi at my house in the uk you get yeah. the idea yeah um so yeah it was tough i climbed everest as a two-man team which is rare um, but it worked well for us. We were able to be much more agile and make decisions quickly. For example, on our summit push, we found ourselves in a queue. I don't like queuing at the supermarket, let alone near on 8,000 metres. And I thought that nah, we're going to take steps to avoid this. So we waited at the high camp, 8,300 metres. This place feels like the end of the earth. Like You don't want to spend the night there. Most people just touch there in the afternoon, have something to eat, have a couple of hours sleep if you can get it, and then push on for the summit later that night. We left in the early hours of the morning to give the two teams ahead a a, sort of a seven hour lead on us. We still had to queue for three hours while they came back down. There was a bit of a bottleneck. Yeah. But the reward was we got to sit on the summit of Everest for half an hour with just the two of us with a blue sky. fantastic. Oh, Half and you got blue the sky. Half one in the day. It's late for a commercial team. That's late. But we'd planned to hit the summit for that time. Honestly, I can't tell you what a privilege that was in that, you know, you can imagine going to all that effort to climb Everest and then you get your one minute on the summit in a queue photo. Quite a lot of people are semi-conscious. I got caught out for... <laughs> called out for calling it a zombie apocalypse because there is the dead which i found really difficult to get my head around and everyone knows there's bodies on everest but to actually step over a dead body is is you know it's quite a thing yeah and that the first body i saw was an australian guy who had died the day before so brand new mountaineering oh, wow. boots fresh down suit you're thinking jesus and it does bring it home to you how fine the line is between life and death when you're you're 8,000 metres or above. Um, But then you get, so there's the dead and then there's the near dead and they move. And generally there's a couple of Sherpas sort of having a cigarette, having a break somewhere near to them. You don't see them straight away. And, and, And I was really shocked by what I saw, I have to say, on Everest. It wasn't, that was a really horrible side of it because... These were people that some of the people I chatted to, they'd never stepped foot on snow before and oh, never worn wow. a pair of crampons before. And they're going to the summit. And the Sherpas, who I've become really close with, this one group of Sherpas who I've worked with and climbed with, and, and one of them I was climbing Everest with, 
you know, and they're friends. And these guys are literally risking their life and limb so that these people can tick a box. And some of them, you know, the Sherpas are hiding behind them on the summit, holding them up so they can no have their way. summit photo. Yeah. Oh, my days. Honestly, I'm... never seen anything like it. I, I hear a little bit of this from anyone that I've spoken to about Everest, but I, yeah, I, know, I, I mean, you've, you've been very, very frank there. I, I hadn't I realised it shocked. was it was quite that bad. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I was very, very shocked, and it's sad because these a lot of the Sherpas, you know, they. <laughs> I, I mean, there's a small joke in here because none of them want to put their head above the parapet and don't want to cause any problems because they don't want to obviously jeopardise their work. Um, yeah. The following year um but there's no you know there sort of needs to be some like a union or something that protects these guys because because there's so much exploitation of the the sherpas and it's heartbreaking to see it um but i laugh with them because you know one of the sherpas was trying to get a uh, sort of petition together and these guys were like no no we're not going to write our names down they've all got the same names because they're all named after the day of the week Oh. so i just said jokingly that you know to them like no seriously guys i think it'll be all right to put your name down <laughs> <laughs> you know they really do there is one of seven names generally speaking um yeah. but on jokes aside i mean these guys are doing like 16 17 hour days lugging backpacks that i couldn't even pick up to the I mean, top my, of Everest. Yeah, my pack was heavy. I had a 13 and a half kilo pack to the summit, which doesn't sound a lot, but your average pack going to the summit of a, you know, a, a normal climber, I suppose, would be, uh, or a or climber on a commercial expedition would be about four or five kilos. Wow. I, I, I've done ultra running with eight kilos on my back, and I know I don't want to do that unless I absolutely have I, to. I bet that so. felt heavy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I bet yeah, that it felt definitely heavy. does. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Everest was amazing in that getting to experience climbing the world's highest mountain, but there was just a side of it I hadn't seen on any other mountain that I'd climbed. And when people say, would you go back? No, definitely not. I've, I've been back to Everest base camp since, but no way. I don't want to see that ever again. I don't want to ever, ever see the sort of things I saw there. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was heartbreaking. It was sad, and the waste, you know, the litter and everything. It was it was yeah. It's not how it, it's not how it should be. No, no, absolutely not. Oh well, yeah. Holly, I'm glad for your sake you got your half an hour up at the top at least <laughs> with with your beautiful view. But no, it sounds like there's a lot going on there that really needs to be addressed. I think so too, and it'd be interesting to see how Everest comes back with a, uh, you know. With, the co with COVID, I mean, I've seen already some of the the big players have postponed their or cancelled their their expeditions uh, for this spring. So well, who knows? What as with a lot of things in this out. crisis, maybe the end of the pandemic will be a chance to start yeah. again and do it right. But I've sent money to the Sherpas that I, you know, their friends, and for them, this is their income for the half the year. Is that one Everest trip? or another yeah. climbing trip. Um, so, you know, I've from, because my bread and butter is speaking, I do lots of keynote motivational. And I just think, you know, God, if I can just help these guys out, they've helped me out. Um, so just get them through these tough times. Um, so, you know, every little helps on that front, but, you know, it's tough. It's tough well, for fantastic. us all. But... I, I guess people can get in touch with you if they want to offer any support in that direction as well. Yeah. And I don't normally talk Holly, about. Sorry. I don't normally talk about that because normally I'm just pushing the elephants. But you know, I, I guess everyone's got their struggle, haven't they? In this, in this, uh, in this pandemic. But well, wow, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of the end of the pandemic and things that come next, I'm going to use the last remaining few seconds I've got with you. Are there any adventures on the uh, on the horizon here that I should know about? Yeah. Or am I going to have to um, ask you at a later date? All, all adventure well a couple of things all adventure with purpose for the charity so back to africa back to sort of seeing where the money i'm raising is being spent um with the anti-poaching initiatives i want to hike the great wall of china to carry out research into how does elephant ivory fit into their culture and their deep-rooted traditions and beliefs 
humbly, I might add. Um, but I'm just using adventure as it's easier to get the sponsors and the media behind it, but use it as a research trip. Yeah. Um, and then on just a, a selfish indulgence level, um, I've been accepted into the Silk Road mountain bike race, which is 1800 kilometers across Kazakhstan in a under two weeks, self-supported. Boom. It sounds entirely up your street, Holly. Fantastic. Yeah, I don't, yeah. We'll we'll see. That sounds tougher than than uh, most things that I've done in, on an endurance level. But well, we shall see. <laughs> if you'd be if you'd be uh, agreeable to it, Holly, I, I I plan on bugging you after you've done that. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'd love to I'll hear come. a bit more about that. Yeah. No, I'm, I'd be delighted to uh, tell you how I get on with that. <laughs> Well, and on that note then, um, yeah. it just remains to say thank you very much, Holly. I, no I, I had a feeling this was going to be an interesting episode <laughs> and uh, every story you have seems to be brilliant. So thank well, you very much. Thank you. Been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. You enjoy the rest of your day. And you. Thanks, Will. Well.